Hiya! Welcome to LSB Feaster's radio channel and travel corner where we keep great radio from the past alive. Today, we are heading to New York in 102.7 WNEW New York. It's a tribute that WNEW did back in 1982 for Murray the K, Murray Kaufman, when he passed away back in 1982. Now, if you don't know much about Murray the K, he was huge in New York rock and roll radio in the 1950s, the 1960s, 1970s. And during the early days of Beatlemania, Murray often referred to himself as the fifth Beatle. Uh, Mary spent time on the air in New York at WMCA, WMGM, WORFM, WKTU, WNBC, but he was best loved for all the years he spent at WINS in New York. Murray also did a short run at 1050 Chum in Toronto. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, Murray was also remembered for the big rock and roll shows he used to host back in the day. Uh, WNEW put this tribute together featuring some of their legendary jocks like Scott Muni, Dennis Elsis, Pete Fornatal, Dave Herman, and others sharing their thoughts and memories of Murray the K. Hey, if you like what you hear, give it a thumbs up. Also, feel free to subscribe to the channel. And when you do, smack that bell. And when you do, you'll be notified whenever we post anything new. Hey, a big thank you to our friend Rob Frankel who supplied this air check. It is 1982. Let's go back to the Murray the K tribute on 1027 WNEW FM, New York. Hey, baby, it's Murray the K with the Beatles, and we're talking to you from London, England, where it's all happening over here on the set of Hard Day's Night in London, England. Now we're out in the field where the boys are running around, uh, twicking them, uh, studios. It's uh, actually a location of a large field, and uh, they're doing various uh, shots. The boys uh, falling down on the ground and the whole bit. John's going to a luncheon with muddy shoes. You know, there's just one club you go to all the time because you know that that's the only place that you're not going to get bothered. Mm -hmm. It's a shame. Well, there's one or two others, but this is the current craze, you see, this one. Oh, that's what's happening? Yeah. <coughs> Do you, um... Excuse me, I'm... <coughs> in the United States, you got to find... you got to find... we got to find some spots for you to come back to New York so you can go with... won't have the same scene that happened over yeah. there. Because I was speaking... How about the Empire States? The it's top of it is... Club. It's a yeah, it's a big club, baby. <laughs> it's a tower. It's the tower, last big tower of strength is right. Up there, you know, I'll tell you one thing. When you go out to uh, uh, the States this time, I think that it'd be smart to find a couple of spots. Jackie said she's got to find a couple of spots for you guys to go that you can really enjoy without... Uh, like we did with the yacht, you know. Yeah. Some place you can go off by yourself and really enjoy. Yeah. Uh, that's the spirit. That's the spirit, indeed. Uh, in fact, uh, if you, we, we'd uh, like to put you aboard a yacht. I got a special yacht for you, off the, three miles off the coast. Have our own radio station. And swing. Yeah. And swing, babe. Everything is happening. Be swinging. American guns trained on it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> trained on my Abbey. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, I want to thank you for uh, hitting me to these places to get the boots. And the, I went out and got myself some boots. and Good boots, uh, aren't they? Yeah, and I got myself a couple of suits. I'll come That'll back with my like comedian. Three pounds ten. The little tips much. here and there. <laughs> I'm on commission. Wait, do you, uh, have you made up your mind where you're going to go on vacation yet? Well, yeah, I think, actually, I'll probably be going to Greece. I think so. Really? Yeah, it's a good place. Now? What? I'm not going yet. Oh, I see. Hey, listen, John, I thought perhaps you uh, could read a couple of, uh, you know, your writings there. I certainly will, Murray. Hold on. Uh, here, this one's called I Sat Be Lonely, right? I sat be lonely down a tree, humbled fat and small. A little lady sing to me. I couldn't see at all. I'm looking up and at the sky to find such wondrous voice. Puzzle, puzzle, wonder why I hear, but I've no choice. Speak up, come forth, you ravel me, I potty menthol shout. I know you're hiddy by this tree, but still she won't come out. Such softly singing lulled me sleep an hour or two or so. I wake me slow and took a peep and still no lady show. Then suddy on a little twig I thought I see a sight. A tiny little tiny pig that sing with all its might. I thought you were a lady, I giggle, well I may. To my surprise, the lady got up and flew away. The end. Davy. You're listening to a tribute to Murray the K on WNEW-FM. Tell me, baby. Tell me. Scott Muni. I remember when uh, Murray the K and I worked together at ORFM at the very beginning of progressive music and progressive rock. 
One of the things I remember most about Murray is that he was always late. <laughs> and <laughs> I used to have to do the first part of Murray the Gay show or whatever it was. And sometimes he was late because he was late. Sometimes he was late because he was having a trauma. Murray used to have a lot of traumas. And he had to get himself in a mood to go on the air. And at 6.30 or quarter to 7, he's supposed to be on the air at 6 o'clock. Murray would be in the boss's office on the sofa getting uh, psychiatric uh, advice from the boss and other people and his music guy and um, I'd say hey Murray get off the sofa and get on the air or else I'm gonna and that was fun <laughs> we used to have our thing and actually uh, one time uh, Murray and I lived in the same apartment building here in this massive place called New York City and the only time I'd ever see Murray we lived in the same building and I would see him like four o'clock in the morning in a garage we're both coming in, staggering around, doing whatever we were doing. Or I'd see him at some strange hour in the morning. We're both up early, checking the mailboxes out. Hey, ski is that? How you doing? I say, how you doing? Me, Missouri. And we do all that. And he said, Jackie Decay and I'm Murray Decay. I say, I know you're Murray Decay, you know. And who am I? He said, I remember you. Yeah, you're Scott. So, all right, whatever. And we had a lot of fun. And um, and I'd say, Murray, you know what? If if you ever take your hat off and stop dancing with those young girls, the you know Murray the K and his dancing uh, girls, and uh, the soiree girls and all that, I said, what are you going to do? He said, I have no idea, but I think I'm going to be in trouble. What's happening, baby? Everything's happening, baby. It's This is Dave Herman. Before Murray was Murray the K on Winds. He was on the air on WMCA as Murray Kaufman. And he didn't do a rock and roll show. He did kind of an M.O.R. show. We're now talking about the mid-50s, mid to late 50s. And I was a kid at the time and loved this guy's show. 11 to 12, one hour a night. And on Saturday nights, he had a two-hour show and he devoted the extra hour to what he called the Record Review Board. And he would have uh, kids come on the show and review new releases. So... I got on the record review board, me and my friend Barry, got on the record review board. We were in high school. And uh, when the whole thing was over, he came over to me and he said, you know, you have a real kind of way on, on the microphone. You ought to think about maybe, maybe going into the business. And I said, I wanted, I've been wanting to go into the business since I'm about five years old. So it was a tremendous thrill. And he then really helped me. He put me in touch with, uh, with certain people uh, to study with. And um, I got into broadcasting. Uh, through Murray the K. It was shortly after that that he went over to Winds and became not Murray Coffin, but Murray the K and uh, made such an indelible mark and was such a unique disc jockey. And there aren't that many DJs who have a uniqueness like that Murray did. All of us who work here at NEWFM and all of the people who listen to us, I mean, certainly anybody over the age of uh, 23 or 24 uh, who loves rock and roll had to have been influenced by the tremendous hours of, of fun and the craziness and lunacy and submarine watching and all of the great records that Murray played for us all when we were kids. And Murray is gone, but his influence remains, and uh, we've got to remember uh, what he was to rock and roll. Now, this interview that I did with Murray that came many, many years later, in fact, this is just a few years ago, had to do with a, a, a syndicated special that I was doing on Roger Daltrey and The Who. And uh, Murray, the K, was the very first person to introduce the Who to American audiences way back in the, in the mid-60s. So I went up to Murray's office and I did uh, a little tape with him. I wanted to find out uh, his first reactions and his memories about the first time he met Roger Daltrey and he met the Who. And uh, that's what this uh, bit of tape is all about. From meeting with Roger and talking to him, turns out that once again, Murray the K was influential in bringing over people to the United States and getting really involved with them and launching a, a, a major rock sensation in the 60s. How did you first find out about them? Because they were totally unknown in the United States. I was having a conversation with Brian Epstein. Um, I had just started a station in New York called ORFM, which I guess was the first contemporary progressive FM station. Brian was really fascinated with the idea, and he came over one day and spent four hours on the air with me, and then afterwards we were talking. And I had was planning on, you know, my Anista show. I hadn't 
gotten any ideas of what I wanted to do, but I was sort of leaning away from the Fox show and and wanted to do a show that was more commensurate with the, the new image and the new uh, artists that I was having a lot of fun discovering at that time. A conversation started, and uh, we were talking about some of the, the acts over in England, and he started to describe a guitar player who would uh, play the guitar with his uh, toenails and with his tongue and everything. And it sounded to me like um, a guy that I knew in the village by the name of Jimmy James. And it turned out that he was talking about someone by the name of Jimi Hendrix, who had now under the name of Jimi Hendrix and was doing it in England. Well, I, he gave me a record a thing called Hey Joe. It knocked me out. Not only Jimmy so much, but the bass line in that, you know, just destroyed me because, you know, we were just getting into stereo at that time as far as broadcasting. And I wanted to find out about him, and I was asking about some people who I had played with when I was playing John Mayel, uh, and one of the guitar players was Eric Clapton. And he told me about a new group called The Cream. And he also told me about a group when we got to talk about Jimi Hendrix, who broke their instruments and uh, destroyed their instruments after each show, and he described the Who to me. I said, well, what's happening? He said, well, we've started at an agency, Robert Stigwood and I. What happened was that I got a hold of a record called Happy Jack. And this sort of blew me away because uh, this very mellow, light kind of sound did not connote the kind of excitement which he was telling me about. But then I heard some other things that they had done. And it was going to be an event where I was going to bring all three, and then something happened and Jimmy couldn't make it. So what I did do is I got on the phone with Warner Brothers, who had the rights, and I literally called them five times to force them to put out the Hendrix record. But um, it took me, when I, when I booked The Who, and uh, then booked The Cream on the same show, I went through hell to try to get uh, MCA to release the record. They weren't even going to release the record, Happy Jack. I mean, I literally forced them to release the record, and I brought the fellas over, and I brought over the cream, and then the same show was the cream and the who. This was in 1967. It was the Easter show of 1967, which we held at the Archeo 58th Street Theater. I met Roger and uh, Keith and uh, everyone from the group. <laughs> It was quite an experience having them. Um, first of all, it was an experience for them because they never... Uh, I think Hitler was before their time and they weren't expecting him backstage, you know. And I, I ran a very tight ship backstage and especially uh, when I used to, I never tolerated stage weights. Uh, to me, that was... You know, I never could get into that new form of... Uh, well, if we're 15 minutes late, we're 15 minutes late. But when you're doing six shows a day and you have people outside and you know that if you go past 75 minutes in the show, you're paying overtime to your band. That didn't bother me so much, but, you know, the people standing in line did. But here at the Archeo 58th Street, on that show, I also had the Blues Project. It was a different concept from the Temptations and the Four Tops and Smokey Robinson, the Miracles and the Supremes. So they had to learn a, a discipline which they were not used to backstage. And the thing which blew me away is that we averaged four shows a day at, at the, uh, except when uh, the Rascals, who were very big, uh, I think I ran five shows for the two days they were there. But they blew out the entire um, electrical system of the theater at least once a day. The Who did. The Who did, yes. And um, I'd have long conversations with them, right? And they had this little roadie who would take care of their equipment. And he was sneaking around while the thing was on, and I'm... I'm telling people who are my spotters outside because I always, you know, I'm, I'm a stickler for the stage looking right. And he said, we see this this guy. It looks like he's ready to bomb the place. He's running back and forth. He's crawling on his hands and knees. And what he was doing was setting these explosive devices which, you know, when they would do something and hit a cord or something and then all of his smoke would go up. He almost started three fires and all that, you know. And... Um, I had uh, the K girls at that time, and one of the K girls and Keith, the the drummer, were getting it on really good, right? So I decided that I wasn't, you know, I would speak to them, and I'd have a, you know, I'd talk about 
uh, I'd have these meetings, and there was Eric Clapton and and Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce and and the entire Roger and everyone. And, there I am telling them, you know, that they're not showbiz, <laughs> which of course they were, and, you know, and that we we couldn't do shows like this, you know, because it was, you know, go ahead and do your thing, but do it within, you know, get your get your act together, you know, don't blow out theaters, you know, these stage weights, it's terrible, and uh, so we'd have these long conversations, and I figured the best way to get through them is use. A, a device. So I used one of the K girls, you know, to try to get the, to explain to them, you know. But it was really a very, um, it was quite an experience for them. Um, Roger said it was, of all of the things that he's done, with the Who and on his own, it was the zaniest and craziest, was it two weeks long, ten days? Ten days. Yeah. Yeah. He said the craziest ten days he's ever had in his life. Right, yeah, it is. It's an experience, uh, especially if you, you know, get to a theater at 9.30 in the morning, you don't leave until 1, and then uh, the crowds, and of course, to see the reaction, um, you know, it blows away a lot of people who were into progressive radio at that time, and now is, uh, you realize that they were there, and a little bit of, bit of history of seeing those two particular groups, and the who, who have gone on to... Uh, st not only stick together, but to superstar them and into all of the media. Now, we had incidents. Like, there are certain shows, if you're running five, during the days that we run five, you have to throw one show away. You get the two matinees for the teeny boppers, right? And then you want to get two good shows uh, for the evening crowd so that you have to, in order to keep, because it is a continuous performance, uh, and let's face it, you know, you saw The Who and The Cream and The Blues Project and uh, uh, Mitch Ryder and The Detroit Wheels and Wilson Pickett. And uh, we had a few other, you know, acts there. And the whole... Even Phil Oaks, I think. And Phil Oaks was there. Simon and Garfunkel did a night and so did Judy Collins, uh, which was their way of saying, hey, we like what you're doing radio-wise now. And they were there, and the whole, you know, I never charged more than $2.50. Plus, I went out and I spent $20,000 on screen, so I had a lot of, you know, uh, ways of introducing them via film. Um, so I was very uptight because this is going to be the first show that I wasn't going to make the kind of money that I was used to making in Fox. That was a very artistic kind of uh, attempt at my, at, you know, of trying to combine the best of rock and the best of a progressive acts. Um, I think that Roger uh, was very intimidated by something that happened. They, uh, I wanted to tell you about this show, which is around a 5 o'clock show, and the audience at that time, you know, you could, the kids have to get home to go to school, and the big crowd uh, for the evening has not gathered yet, so you do what was called a dinner show. And this is going back to old vaudeville, where you're throwing one away. You know, you have to do one show, which is not the ideal time. They got through doing the, the number, right, and after one, and you hear the last thing, and there's like one of those things. And one, right, and one older guy in the audience you could hear say, my God, that's terrible. <laughs> like, uh, and I could see, you know, the rest of the band broke up, but I noticed Roger's face when that happened. And I noticed that the next act, the next time they came out to do their... Uh, number or whatever the next show was he had changed around a lot of the numbers and the approach to the things and so he was very very sensitive Roger said one night while they were breaking up their equipment and they actually did have to get all new equipment after each show and they were doing as you said five a day or four a day oh yeah but that see they never did that before so what they were doing is that this little roadie of theirs I would leave the theater you know one o'clock in the morning and I'd come back on stage and um there he was with tape and glue, and he's, he was trying to, you know, they just couldn't do it. Uh, it would be much too expensive. So what he was doing was doing a lot of pasting up and gluing and things. And putting the instruments back together again. Roger said he recalled that at one show, uh, while they were destroying everything, they destroyed your personal microphone. Do you, yes. do you remember that? Yes, they did. They really did. They, they did. Uh, as long as they, you know, at that time, I still had the hat. That was the last show that I ever wore the, you know, the old Marie the K image of the, the straw hat. And, um, but they really, they took my mic and, you know, because they would blow out a mic or anything, they, they were just wild. They were like, you knew, um, uh, Wilson Pickett said, um, he said, God, 
Damn, man, don't call me down to the stage. Murray, have a heart. Wait till you get those juvenile delinquents off stage, you know. Because <laughs> it would be a mess. And the stagehands, they wouldn't talk to me. I mean, these guys who I knew came over from Fox to do all shows. They said, Murray, have you gone crazy? They're going to ruin you. And believe it or not, they didn't go over that well. They did every, all of their numbers, everything that we know, you know, for them to do. But it's terrible when you uh, throw, you end up throwing, he even threw uh, the drums into the pit, you know. There was utter destruction on stage. It was, it was like the atom bomb hit at every time, you know. And I had to find um, a way so that whoever followed them there would be a normal stage rate where we'd close the curtains and have to set the stage up which you know so i had to find a spot for them because i never would have put them in that spot if they didn't destroy the stage like they did i would have put them up in a different spot than they were in because at that time they weren't strong enough to cover to to uh, a hold the spot that i gave them i think that they would get to this great crescendo of this cacophony of sound and the destruction of the instruments and uh, big puffs of smoke and and sparks are flying and you think the world is coming to an end on stage and they're playing they weren't kidding you know they were giving out and you know there's one thing about them you know they weren't throwing any shows you know and um uh, I felt like going over to them and say, yeah, how much would you take to throw the show? <laughs> but they were really giving it all. And at the end, just to hear a smattering of applause, that's a, you know, that's a bummer. But that's where you learn. You know, you learn that the, that you were used to in England of absolutely destroying the people and having people get as hysterical as they got. But I never tried to hold a, a performer like the Who, you know. Uh, I've never asked them to do another show and say, okay, I brought you over now. Same thing with the Stones. I brought them over as a favor to John Lennon. But I've never, you know, they've never done another show for me. Neither has the Who. Roger Daltrey is definitely a superstar who is growing steadily because he is doing a lot of things and he's building um, the ladder one step at a time. I started in show business when I was five and the reason I say this about Roger is he's doing something which Al Jolson, when I was five years old, my uncle was a writer, so I, I did, my first thing was a movie with Eddie Cantor and my next thing was a Broadway show with Al Jolson, so I really got to start pretty good, you know, with some pretty good company. And I always remember Jolson's philosophy about show business is that if you go up that ladder of success one rung at a time if you get to the top and you have a bad year or something happens you only fall one rung of the ladder but if you go up from the first rung go all the way to the top there's nothing there that you have built you're going to fall right from the top right down to the bottom and that's happened to a lot of people <laughs> Hi, this is Pete Fornitel, and I just wanted to add my voice to this tribute to Murray the K because, well, because if you grew up in New York in the 50s and 60s, and if you grew up listening to and loving rock and roll, and if you grew up wanting desperately to play rock and roll records on the radio someday, and then by some unbelievable, incredible chain of events, you actually got to do it, well, then you, too, would want to say thank you to the handful of people who made it all possible. And Murray the K was one of those people. Thanks, Murray. Another man with great stature in the rock and roll field is Dick Clark. Back in the old days when nobody knew what a Beatle was, Murray was astute enough to realize that they had that singularly uh, extraordinary talent, and I guess that's one of the reasons he became the fifth Beatle. He helped spread the gospel. He was an intimate friend of John Lennon's. He made some extraordinary video and audio tapes in his lifetime, but uh, he was the man who helped spread the word. Once again, Steve Leeds. Murray was one of the prime innovators of album rock or progressive radio. I mean, you could turn on Murray's show at six o'clock every evening and one time there would be Brian Epstein of the, bringing over a, a copy of the Magical Mystery Tour or Sgt. Pepper I mean the Bee Gees would be on uh, I mean all the I mean if you were in town and you were anything you had to stop by and see Murray the K because he was the only guy that was playing a lot of records at that point so his legacy is bringing a lot more music to a lot more people I would just hope that some people in the industry or outside of the industry 
would take the time to think about it and something will happen to Murray the K chemotherapy fund or Murray the K cancer fund, anything that would associate him with helping wipe that out or make the pain easier on others that have to go through similar things, I think would be one of the better tributes to him at this point. WNEWFM has given you a special program tonight on someone who is very important, was very important, and uh, will always be remembered as someone as a great contributor to the fun that is rock music and New York radio, Murray the K. We lost our friend Murray quite recently, and we're proud here at WNEWFM to have put together a special show tonight for those of you who remember Murray, those of you who never knew him and, and don't even know the name so that you know part of Rock's history. Our thanks to Earl Bailey, who put all this together tonight, produced our show in memory of Murray the K. And my thanks to Steve Leeds, whose tapes, records, ideas, knowledge, and emotions makes it possible for DJs such as Murray the K to live on in the memory of his audience. I quit uh, Wins and decided to, to get the idea of FM radio and started WORFM. That's my most memorable thing of starting a whole new concept of, of radio. That was my biggest thrill, I guess.